In his account of the civil wars, Julius Caesar wrote, Prestige has always been the most important thing to me, even more important than my life. For a man so concerned with his reputation, he might be pleased to note that 2000 years later, he's as famous as ever. Whatever one thinks of him, Caesar's life was one of scandal and controversy. Was he a tyrant, a savior, or something in between? In this video, we explore the scandalous life of Julius Caesar and ask what reputation he really deserves. If you appreciate videos like this, please leave a like to show your support and subscribe for more videos like this. Gaius Julius Caesar was born in Rome in 100 BC, into the prestigious Gens Julia family. His childhood was spent in the shadow of Italy's social war, and then a civil conflict between Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Caesar's uncle, Gaius Marius, while the Senate floundered and struggled to respond to the crises facing the Republic. Sulla emerged victorious, forcing a young Caesar to ship out to the military early to avoid facing punishment for his uncle's actions. Young Caesar served with distinction in the legions in Greece and Asia. He earned special honors for his bravery at the Siege of Mytilene on the island of Lesbos in 81 BC. Caesar also rubbed shoulders with foreign rulers, most notably King Nicomedes IV of Bithynia with whom he allegedly had a close relationship. Already, Caesar was proving to be charismatic and capable. He also proved to be uncompromising and fearless. While sailing off the coast of Asia Minor, Caesar was captured by pirates. According to Plutarch, Caesar was outraged that the pirates were ransoming him for 20 talents. He insisted he was worth 50. Caesar spent several weeks with the pirates, where he joined games with his captors and entertained them with speeches and poetry. They got on so well that Caesar would joke with them and promise that he would crucify them when he was freed. Eventually, the ransom was paid, and Caesar was not one to break his promises. He immediately gathered his forces and set out in pursuit of the pirates, captured them, and true to his word, had them crucified. Caesar only returned to Rome after Sulla's death in 78 BC, where he became renowned as a legal advocate. He had a respectable political career in a succession of offices, but his ambition was not satisfied. When he was 32, Suetonius tells us that Caesar fell to his knees before a statue of Alexander the Great and lamented that he had achieved only a fraction of what Alexander had done by that age. However, it wouldn't be long before Caesar's life became more exciting. In 63 BC, the senator Lucius Sergius Catiline attempted to assassinate the consuls and seize control of the Republic. The plot failed and the conspirators were caught. Many people wanted them to be executed without a trial. Chief among these voices were Cato the Younger and Marcus Tullius Cicero. It was Caesar who tried to convince the Senate that the men deserved a trial. Although his speech was powerful, Cato and Cicero's arguments prevailed and the men were executed. Caesar himself was even accused of being aligned with them. Caesar's argument might have failed, and he made lifelong enemies of Cato and Cicero, but his reputation for powerful oratory and political boldness was clear, and he was fast becoming one of the most well-known faces in Rome. Caesar's rise to the top of Roman politics was meteoric. In 62 BC, he achieved tremendous military success in Spain and used that momentum to secure an election to the consulship in 60 BC. The consuls were the two highest officers in the Roman Republic and were usually considered the apex of one's political career. However, even this was not enough for Caesar. Around this time, Caesar forged an alliance with two of Rome's most powerful figures, Marcus Licinius Crassus and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, better known as Pompey. 
Crassus was the wealthiest man in Rome and Caesar, like many Roman politicians, was deeply in debt to him. Meanwhile, Pompey was one of the most respected military and political figures in the Republic. With Crassus's wealth, Pompey's prestige and Caesar's energy, the trio formed a political alliance that would dominate the Republic for the next decade. Pompey married Caesar's only legitimate daughter, Julia, to seal the alliance. Called the First Triumvirate, it was an informal union where all three men would use their power to advance each other's interests. This domination of the political system angered other politicians like Cicero and Cato, but no one was able to organize an effective countermeasure. Perhaps the most important achievement of the Triumvirate came with Caesar's appointment to deal with Gaul, modern France. Caesar got himself appointed as proconsul of Gaul for five years, later extended beyond that and committed to subjugating the whole region. Caesar was utterly ruthless. In 55 BC, Caesar crushed the Eusebites and tanked Terry groups near the Rhine, massacring men, women, and children by the thousands. The violence was so excessive that Caesar's enemies in the Senate wanted to put him on trial for war crimes. Cato even suggested giving Caesar over to the barbarians. Caesar also mounted expeditions across the Rhine into modern Germany and landed the first Roman army in Britain, although Plutarch tells us that Caesar quickly left because, quote, there was nothing worth taking. Caesar's subjugation of Gaul came to a head in 52 BC with the massive revolt of Vercingetorix. Although the Gauls managed a miraculous minor victory at the Battle of Gergovia, Caesar's veteran legions were too strong. Caesar besieged Vercingetorix in the town of Alessia and constructed some of the most elaborate siege works ever seen. His armies built miles of walls, trenches, and moats that prevented the besieged Gauls escaping while defending Caesar from the reinforcements he knew would come. By the time Gallic reinforcements arrived, Caesar's fortifications were formidable, and the relieving army failed to overcome him. Recognizing that his situation was hopeless, Vercingetorix surrendered. Caesar's victory in Gaul was all but complete. Caesar would spend the next year or two mopping up lingering unrest in the province. For almost 10 years, he had enjoyed supreme military and political authority there with minimal oversight from the Senate. The historian Cassius Dio argued that this experience changed Caesar's perspective. He had tasted unrestrained power and he would not give it up so easily. Meanwhile, the first triumvirate was shattered in 53 BC, when Crassus was killed by Parthians at the Battle of Carhai. Although Caesar and Pompey remained allies, the death of Julia around the same time only weakened the bonds between them. By this time, Caesar had a political and military reputation to rival Pompey's. Pompey tried to assert his superiority by recalling Caesar from the provinces and demanding that he disarm. He insisted that Caesar was too dangerous to be left unchecked and found eager allies in the enemies Caesar had made over the years. On the other hand, Caesar claimed that it was Pompey who had become too powerful. Caesar pointed to Pompey's monopolization of key offices and his violation of countless traditions as proof of Pompey's desire to wield absolute power. Most modern historians believe that neither man truly wanted war, but neither was willing to concede superiority to the other. In the words of one historian, Pompey would tolerate no equal, Caesar would brook no superior. By 49 BC, their disagreements were irreconcilable. Pompey, now allied with the Senate, demanded that Caesar give up his commands. Caesar refused and was dubbed an enemy of the state. Caesar's allies fled Rome and rallied to him in Cisalpine Gaul. He saw no path but war. 
In January 49 BC, Caesar marched his armies to the banks of the Rubicon River that separated Gaul from Italy. There, Caesar riled up his legions with claims of Pompey's treachery and injustices. Then, Caesar made his most daring gamble as he entered Italy with an army at his back. The die had been cast, but the odds were far from certain. Pompey and his allies were unprepared. Caesar advanced rapidly with minimal resistance. When Pompey's forces encountered Caesar, they defected in droves. Pompey and the Senate represented the stagnation and chaos of the Republic, but Caesar was the beloved war hero who had brought all of Gaul to heel. By all accounts, he enjoyed huge popular support. Recognizing the danger, Pompey and his allies fled across the Adriatic before Caesar could catch them. Caesar returned to Rome as the master of Italy. He threatened any senators who opposed him, filled every high office with his allies. Leaving Italy under the watch of his right-hand man Mark Anthony, Caesar spent the next few months swiftly dealing with Pompey's allies in Spain, while Pompey regrouped in Greece. In January 48 BC, Caesar pursued him across the sea. However, Caesar would not find easy victory as he had in Gaul. Pompey was a formidable commander, and at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, Caesar's forces were forced into retreat, and he even admitted that the war would have ended there if Pompey had pursued him. Pompey chose to wait before chasing Caesar into Thessaly, but this would be a critical mistake. Caesar had time to reorganize and shake off the loss, while Pompey and his forces became overconfident. The two armies met again at the Battle of Pharsalus in August 48 BC, where Caesar's loyal veteran legions crushed Pompey's much larger army. Pompey fled once more and his allies melted away. Caesar offered forgiveness to anyone who came over to him, including his old enemy Cicero. The long list of pardoned men also included an old friend of Caesar's, Marcus Junius Brutus. Caesar followed Pompey to Egypt. However, King Ptolemy XIII tried to win Caesar's favor by assassinating Pompey and offering him the man's head. Caesar was horrified. Pompey was his enemy, but Caesar still respected him. Rather than reward them, Caesar had Pompey's assassins executed. This put him at odds with Ptolemy, but he soon found a new ally in Ptolemy's bold, ambitious, and cunning sister. Cleopatra. In a matter of months, Caesar overcame Ptolemy's forces and the young pharaoh drowned in the Nile. Caesar's fighting in Egypt is overshadowed by his legendary love affair with Cleopatra. Caesar already had a long list of romantic and sexual entanglements. Earlier in his career, Cato had called Caesar out for receiving notes during a Senate session. If it was so important that he needed to read it now, then Cato insisted that Caesar read the letter out to the Senate. Caesar stood up and proceeded to read out a love letter written to him by Cato's own sister. Other rumors swirled about the suspiciously long time Caesar spent in the court of King Nicomedes of Bithynia. This was an outrage, not because Caesar slept with the king, but because Caesar had been the submissive partner, which was seen as inappropriate for a true Roman. Although remembered as one of history's great scandalous love affairs, the alliance between Caesar and Cleopatra was also a sound political move. Cleopatra used it to secure the throne of Egypt, which also secured Caesar access to Egypt's vast resources. Caesar spent several months touring Egypt with her, and by the time he left, Cleopatra was pregnant with his son, who she'd named Caesarian. Some historians believe that his experiences in Egypt, where rulers were seen as divine, made Caesar desire the same level of power and respect in Rome. Eventually, Caesar returned to the task of eliminating the last of Pompey's supporters. He defeated Cato in North Africa, but rather than take Caesar's pardon, his old enemy committed suicide. Caesar then proceeded to Spain where he defeated the last of Pompey's forces and killed Pompey's eldest son. 
his victory was finally complete. Caesar returned to Rome in 46 BC, where he was appointed dictator. In the Roman Republic, dictator was an emergency office that gave someone supreme power for a period of time, usually six months, and had been used many times in the past. However, Caesar's dictatorship did not have such an expiration date. He held an unprecedented five triumphs to celebrate different victories. In his Gallic triumph, he paraded Vercingetorix before the people of Rome and executed him before the cheering crowds. However, Caesar's Egyptian triumph caused some discomfort when Ptolemy's queen, Arsinoe, who was also Cleopatra's sister, was paraded in chains. Even more outrageous was the triumph for his victory over Pompey's allies in Spain. Plutarch writes that people were angry that Caesar celebrated the destruction of a prestigious Roman family. Caesar set in motion many popular projects and policies. He ordered some debt forgiveness, rewarded his veterans with wealth and land, reorganized the chaotic Roman calendar, and ordered new construction projects, like a new forum and the Temple of Venus Genetrix. He also planned construction projects across Rome's territories, from Corinth to Carthage, and began preparing a campaign against the Parthian Empire in the east. Caesar also tightened his control over the political system. Since the Senate had been decimated by the civil war, he filled it with his own allies, effectively ending political opposition to his ideas, and filled other high offices with his supporters. For Republican idealists, it was an outrage. Cicero wrote that Caesar had trod underfoot all laws of gods and men. Yet, even Cicero acknowledged that the masses supported Caesar's reforms. Caesar appeared fairer and more reliable than Pompey or a bickering senate, and any notion of republican freedom lost out to the security and stability that Caesar promised. Of course, not everyone felt the same way. Many feared that Caesar would establish himself as a king. Caesar had taken many honors and his arrogance was becoming an issue. On one occasion, Caesar refused to stand to greet the senators, which his critics took as a sign of contempt. Caesar's rather unusual excuse was that he had diarrhea and couldn't risk standing. In another striking episode, Mark Anthony offered Caesar a crown in the middle of a festival. The crowd only cheered when Caesar rejected it, but he might have just been testing public opinion. The final straw came on the 15th of February 44 BC, when Caesar was appointed dictator for life. This was too far. Dozens of senators hatched a conspiracy to eliminate Caesar once and for all, led by Caesar's friend and pardoned enemy Brutus. The fateful day came on the Ides of March. According to some sources, Caesar had been warned by a soothsayer that something evil would happen to him that day. Caesar took the warning seriously at first, but when the day came and he saw nothing out of the ordinary, Caesar dismissed it and went to the Senate. On the way, he passed the soothsayer and taunted him, saying that the Ides of March had come and he was perfectly fine. Aye, they have come, the soothsayer replied but they have not gone. Inside the Senate, one of the conspirators approached Caesar. Then he grabbed the dictator by the toga as the first assassin struck him in the neck. Caesar was silent as blow after blow rained down on him. It was only when he saw his friend Brutus that he spoke, in Greek, you too my son, before he fell. The conspirators and the bystanders fled, leaving Caesar to bleed out from 23 stab wounds at the foot of a statue of his old enemy Pompey.
far from restoring the Republic, Caesar's death marked its end. The conspirators had misjudged public opinion. Mark Anthony and Caesar's nephew Octavian rallied Rome against the conspirators and crushed them. Eventually, Octavian would remove Anthony and follow Caesar's precedent as he forged the Roman Empire and became Augustus. Every Roman emperor would bear the title Caesar, in honor of the man who many saw as the father of the empire. To some, Caesar was the murderer of the Republic. His dictatorial ambitions strangled the last vestiges of Roman democracy and ushered in centuries of authoritarian rule. They point to the adoration of Caesar by future dictators, like Mussolini, as proof of his evil. To this day, the assassins' motto, Six Semper Tyrannis, remains a rallying cry for freedom and resistance to tyranny. However, others say that the Republic was already dead. Decades of civil wars and the careers of men like Sulla and Pompey showed that the Republican system was already gone. Rather than the cause of its death, Caesar was merely a symptom. Others argue that he was a cure. Caesar won massive support for his reforms and laid the groundwork for an imperial system that made Rome the most powerful empire on earth for centuries. What do you think of Julius Caesar? Was he a tyrant or did he set Rome on the path to a new golden age? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos like this one.